on location in the Holy Land. David Taverner from UCB travels with Bible teacher and church pastor Mike Beaumont to trace the life of Jesus then and now. As we've been following the life of Jesus around the Holy Land, Mike, the one subject I've been really keen to hear more from you about is his prayers, how Jesus prayed, how he can help us in that kind of area. So let's focus on his prayer life. What uh, can you remind us about his his prayer life? <laughs> well, it, it was an absolute priority for him, wasn't it? It was the number one thing. It was the hub, uh, the center of every day. And he would do anything that he needed to in order to get time to talk to his father. You know, so we, we find him getting up very early in the morning, it says. That doesn't mean all of us have got to get up very early in the morning. But really what it's saying is he got up at a time when he knew he could get some time just with him and his father. So he'd get up early in the morning. He'd climb up mountains if he had to, to get away from the crowds. But the thing that stands out for me most about Jesus is this matter of it being an absolute priority. But I suppose the next thing is that it was absolutely natural. As a Jew, he would have grown up as a young boy being taught many of the formal prayers of Judaism. But the thing that stood out more than anything else, the thing that caused his disciples to say, Lord, teach us to pray, You know, as they looked at his prayer life and they saw it was so different, they saw it was not a recitation of set prayers simply. But it was about relationship with his heavenly father. It was about sharing his life, sharing his day. So for me, those are the two main things that stand out from the Gospels. The priority that he gave to praying and the relationship with his father that lay at the heart of that praying. In some areas of the church, we talk about prayer requests and praise reports. <laughs> is that oversimplifying it? Well, it, it probably is, but I realise the intention of doing something like that. They're, they're wanting to say, hey, don't just let your prayers be one long list. And I, I think that's the whole thing I was meaning there about, for him, prayer was relational. It was about, I have this little phrase, prayer is conversation with my heavenly father. So part of that ought to be, yeah, bring in your prayer requests. And part of it ought to be bringing your praise to God for what he's done. And part of it ought to be, so Lord, what are we going to do today with this problem here at work? It's about a natural conversation with the Father as much as you would have a conversation with your spouse or with your best mate. We're in a relatively quiet place at the moment, but was it the case that Jesus did seem to go away from noise and hubbub and all the attention that he was getting? I think the thing that Jesus shows us is you can pray anywhere. So often when people come to him with needs, he prays, he lifts his eyes to heaven, he lifts his hands to heaven. Um, Jesus knew that you can pray any place, anywhere, anytime, anyhow. You know, there was no set formula, but what he did love to do for him personally was to have those times in the day where he could get on his own and could get away from distraction. Now, for him, it was going up the hill to get away from the crowds. For me, and I suspect many listeners, do you know the biggest challenge for me when I'm praying is that if my phone in my pocket pings, there is something within me wants to go and look at what it says because it might be so important. You know, and our lives today are so often run by... Our mobile phones, well, my wife tells me that mine is anyway and there's no one better than your wife for telling you home truths, is there? And Jesus got away from the stuff that can interrupt. It was like he wanted to give some wholehearted time and it was not just to talk to God, but to hear God. And that's another important part of prayer. It's not just about bringing to God your requests. It's about listening. It's about saying, Father, what shall we do about this? Father, have you something you want to whisper into my heart is there some scripture you want to bring to mind here and i think it's very hard to listen when the background is full of noise now i know personality comes in here and i have friends 
who find they can pray best when there's worship music playing quietly in the background. So I'm not trying to set rules here. What I'm trying to say is we have to do whatever we have to do to make prayer a priority where we can get that relational time with our Father and share our hearts with him and let him share his heart with us, just like Jesus did. Those who were closest to him, his disciples, seemed to want to know how to pray because they asked him that very question, didn't they? Yeah, they did. They came to him and said, Lord, you know, can you teach us how to pray? Uh, and that's an odd prayer request in a sense because remember, these were Jews. These had been people who had been taught many prayers over their life. And yet they, they saw there was something about the way that Jesus taught that was different, uh, you know, and that leads them, therefore, to, to ask him to, Lord, just how do you do it? How, how do you pray in the way that you pray? And uh, one of the prayers that he taught them was what we now call the Lord's Prayer though we may well have turned that into something that Jesus didn't necessarily intend. How do you mean? Well, in the Gospels that record the Lord's Prayer, that is Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel, Matthew 6 and Luke 11, um, the two Gospel writers give it a slightly different setting. In Luke 11, they've got the disciples coming and saying, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he says to them, when you pray, say, our Father. And therefore, some people have taken that as meaning that the Lord's Prayer is a prayer that is to be prayed, that is to be recited. But when you look at Matthew's Gospel, um, he gives it there not so much as a prayer to be prayed, but a model to be followed. So you know what, now might be actually be a good time to, to read the version that's in Matthew's Gospel. Do you? Yeah. So Matthew 6 and verse 9, he's, he's teaching about prayer. In fact, I'll tell you what, I'll just start a few verses earlier to set it in context from verse 5 where he's teaching his disciples about what real um, spirituality looks like in contrast to that external spirituality of the scribes and Pharisees. So it starts like this, And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, don't keep on babbling like pagans do. For they think that they'll be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. And then he goes on to say this. This then is how you should pray. So in Matthew's version, Matthew says Jesus didn't give us this as a sort of prayer to be prayed necessarily but rather more a how-to, a model of how to pray, some pegs to hang your prayers on. So let's read on there to what he says. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, if you look at that prayer there, it falls into two parts, which I think is still a, a pretty good model to base our own praying on. The first is prayer about God, and the second part is prayer about us. And the first is, is prayer about God, our Father. You know, whenever I use this prayer myself, I always think, I don't, I don't want to go any further. What Jesus is saying is, when you pray, remember first and foremost that you have a Father. You have a Father in heaven. You are not talking to some cold, hard, distant God who might or might not listen, who really doesn't care. 
our Father. You have a Father in heaven. Before you get any further, with any other words, remember, you've got a loving heavenly Father in heaven and you're bringing everything to him. And you just say our Father, not my Father. Yeah, underlining there that, you know, our Christian faith is much more than me and Jesus. It, it, it's me and you and Jesus. It's a reminder that I, I'm not in this on my own. Uh, you too have this same, Father. We're in this together. Our churches are in this together. So having set that first, our Father, whoa, whoa, just remember that before you go further. Then, three prayers. A prayer about honouring him, a prayer that is praying for his kingdom to come, and a prayer for praying his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And do you know what? You can use those as as three pegs, honouring him. Okay, how do you want to honour God today? What song do you want to sing to him? What prayer do you want to say? How, how do you want to say, oh God, you are great and fantastic? Praying for his kingdom to come, not just in general terms, but oh God, I pray your rule would come, which is what kingdom means, of course. I pray for your rule to come, where? Well, first and foremost, Lord, it has to be in my life and it has to be in my family. Oh, and Lord, in my place of work and in this street and in my wider family. And then pray for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the first bit of the prayer focuses about God and getting done what he wants in life. And then the second part, having focused on God, why? Because when you've focused on God first, you've remembered what a big God you have. And that's the point of doing this. You know, if you come to God in prayer with, a, oh God, I've got this problem. What is first and foremost in your mind? Your problem. And it is big. So Jesus here is really saying, listen, get God there first. Portray a picture in your mind of him first. Remember how big and how great and how growing his kingdom is. And I tell you what, anything you're now going to pray about in the second part will seem very small in comparison. So he goes on, doesn't he, to that second part, prayer about us. Prayer for three things again. Prayer for present needs. Give us today our daily bread. Bread was the most fundamental staple of life. Prayer for past sins. Forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. And prayer for future welfare. Please, Lord, deliver us from the attacks of the evil one because the Bible tells us your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So it's prayer in two halves, uh, a teaching from Jesus here. Listen, when you're praying, whether it's long or short, whether it's in your bedroom or up a hillside, start with God first. Remember how big he is and remember he's your father. Right, having done that, second, bring your prayer requests about your own needs, about your own sins and about your own future welfare. Marvellous model to base our praying on and is one that I still use at the back of my Bible that I have here. I've got a laminated version of the Lord's Prayer, which I will pull out from time to time to look at and to meditate on and to let that be a peg on which I hang my prayer. The other thing about the words Jesus used was they seem very down to earth. Oh, good. I'm glad you noticed that because that's exactly what they're meant to be. I mean, it is a prayer of striking contrast to some of the prayers either through church history or that we hear in church today that are full of big and flowery language and that are full of these and thous from a language of the 1600s. It is conversational language. It's respectful language. It's dependent language. But it's conversational language. Remember, Jesus taught us that God is not remote and distant. He's our father. He's our Abba, that Aramaic word for daddy. The word that's still used today here in the Holy Land in both Hebrew and in Arabic. You'll hear little children running down the street shouting, Abba, dad, daddy. And that's the sort of relationship that Jesus wants. Now, personally, I don't thee and thou someone at that level, you know, if it's my dad, I never thee'd and thou'd my dad and I never used ancient language and I talk to him in the language that I'm talking to you now. But more importantly, that's what Jesus did. He does not suddenly go here into a different kind of language. It does not become sort of holy 
and archaic. And for me, that therefore settles the issue. Prayer is truly conversation with my Heavenly Father in your ordinary, everyday language. No special words needed, no special phrases, no special places, no special people. Anybody can turn to God and talk to him, knowing that he will listen. You're sort of saying you can be yourself in prayer. Absolutely. That's a really good way to put it, David, because, you know, I, I've heard and seen Christians sometimes with a good heart, perhaps trying to imitate the way the pastor prays, thinking that that's the way to get God to answer your prayers more. Well, it isn't. And actually, it's, it's being something that you're not. And actually, if I'm really stark about that, what Jesus called that in the New Testament was hypocrisy, mask wearing. So look, please don't try and be anyone else. Don't try and be the minister. Don't try and be the youth leader. Don't try and be the priest or the pope or the visiting traveling evangelist. Learn from these people. Yes, yes, yes. But please don't try and imitate them. God wants a relationship with you. He's made you in your shape and your form. And he just loves to hear you talking to him with your words and your heart. And talking of language, I think I now know why we're here in this particularly <laughs> unusual place, an amazing place. Explain where we are. Yeah, David, we've come to the church of the Paternoster. Paternoster is Latin for our father, the church of the our father, which is a Roman Catholic Church on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. And this church, in its earlier forms, was built above a grotto where Jesus was said to have taught this prayer. Now, I think that bit is very unlikely because Matthew sets it very clearly in the context of the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount up there near Capernaum. But of course, it could well be that Jesus taught the same thing several times, like preachers have the same story that they adapt several times. So who knows, a version of it may have been taught here. Uh, but this church that we've got here, it actually only dates from the sort of the late 1800s, uh, built at the expense of a French princess, but it was built uh, on the ruins of a church that were commissioned by the Emperor Constantine, whose mother, uh, Queen Helena, became a Christian when he did. And she was a great, visitor of the Holy Land and she tried to find out many of the sites where Jesus had been and uh, had her son in, invest in that. And it's on this site that this church where we are is built. Now, why is it called the Paternoster Church, the Our Father Church? Well, quite simply, because not only the inside of what is a very simple, straightforward church there, not only the inside is covered with tablets, with carvings of the Lord's Prayer in different languages. The cloister around it on three sides is also full of the Lord's Prayer, and that wasn't enough, so they've now extended the cloister beyond that to another cloister, and there's bits go off here and that way and the other way, and they are full of the Lord's Prayer written out in over... 140 different languages and dialects. Wow. I was going to say, there's walls all around us covered in the Lord's Prayer in a whole selection of these languages. Beautiful carvings, there's some mosaics, some colours and all the rest of it. Yeah, I mean, as you've looked at them, what a reminder it is that the Lord's Prayer or the way Jesus was teaching about prayer is relevant all around the world. Yeah, absolutely. And what I love is it's not, if you like, all the Western European languages. So there are, there are lots of African languages and dialects. You know, there, there's Shona, there's Swahili, uh, there's Malayalam from India, there's Malay, there's Chinese. And it brings home that the Church of Jesus is a global church. It stretches around the whole earth. That vision John has in his book of Revelation that there in heaven there are people of every tongue and tribe and language and nation is almost mirrored here in microcosm. And it's a reminder that 
not only this prayer, but relationship with Jesus, relationship with God the Father through Jesus. It's not a Western religion. Hey, where are we? We're here in the Middle East. It's not even a Middle Eastern religion. It is a global religion for people of every color skin and every type of hair and every social background, no matter what political system they might live under. This relationship with God through Jesus really works. And this prayer or this model for prayer really works. So it must be wonderful for groups to come from different parts of the world and gather around their particular translation, if you like, of the Lord's Prayer to pray it together and for it to have deep meaning for them. Oh, absolutely. I've stood behind people who have almost wept with joy to find that their language is represented here. Uh, I was here in the Holy Land leading a tour just six months ago and there were people of different nationalities uh, with me on that tour. And I can remember the joy of one, uh, an Indian couple that came from Kerala in South India, coming to me and saying, we found it in Malayalam, we found it in Malayalam. And just the sheer joy, and of course, everyone gets their phones out, they're taking pictures. Why, as a reminder, that the God of heaven is also the God of their nation and that they're included too. And I just think that's wonderful. So I love coming to this place. אבינו אשר בשמיים, מקדש שמך, תבוא מלכותך, יהי רצונך כאשר בשמיים וכן בארץ. לחמנו תמידי יום ביום, תן לנו היום, וסלח לנו את חובתנו, כאשר ואנו סלחנו לבעלי חובתנו. ואל תביאנו לניסיון, כי אם הצלינו מרע, אמן. Is Jesus' example for us to pray at certain times of the day, or a certain number of times every day? No. Um, that's the one thing about Christianity. It doesn't have set prayer times like, say, Islam. Prayer is about conversation with my Heavenly Father. It's about a relationship. And prayer at set times for me is a bit like, you know, getting your diary out and, and saying to your wife, now, uh, what time shall we set to have a conversation today? And the truth is, you know, there'll be times in the day when you end up having a longer chat with one another and talk about things that matter. You know, maybe over breakfast as you're both dashing out will be, hi, toast, thanks, yeah, bye, see you later. And I think there are all sorts of prayers like that, that we can pray to God, the longer ones, the shorter ones, uh, the more focused ones, the more general ones. But the New Testament is very clear. There, there does not have to be set times for prayer. Now, there were some set times in Judaism. And Jesus probably followed those as a Jew himself. Why? To perfectly fulfill the law. But he never teaches them himself. His heart is just that in every time, in every place, in every situation, you should know that you can just call on God as your father and he will be there and he will listen and he will answer. Would it be fair to say that though for Jesus prayer was natural, there were times, particularly towards the end of his life, when prayer was tough? Oh, absolutely. Um, there were times when he definitely had to grapple in prayer, weren't they? I think, you know, one at the beginning of his life was the 40 days that he spent in the wilderness, and we know that he's being tempted and tested by Satan there. There would have been a grappling in prayer at the beginning, but there was certainly also a grappling in prayer at the end, just probably a quarter of a mile from where we are sitting now in the garden of Gethsemane, when he was so grappling in prayer there, recognizing there were dark spiritual forces coming against him, that as he prayed, we read that, you know, he sweated, but his sweat was like drops of blood that came from him. So there was agony and anguish there. So I'm not wanting to make out that prayer is a casual, hey, Lord, hi, good to see you. I think we can do those sort of prayers. I think we also need those sort of prayers where we sit down, turn our phone off, focus on him, give him some time. And there will certainly be those prayers where we're seeking God ardently in anguish. My uh, youngest daughter uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer. She actually was diagnosed twice in the same breast with two different types of cancer. I tell you, my wife and I gave ourselves to crying out to God in prayer over that period, perhaps like we've never cried out before. 
So there are absolutely times for prayer. Uh, the New Testament letters talk about us uh, fighting principalities and powers in prayer at times. That is using prayer as a weapon against the, the devil. So there are all kinds of prayer. I think what I'm just trying to break in this conversation is that prayer is something that belongs in a holy box. It doesn't. It belongs out here in daily life. And there are circumstances where, as you kind of hinted then with your own personal family situation, you shouldn't give up with prayer. Oh, no, absolutely not. Here's the funny thing. Sometimes we pray for something uh, almost even casually, in passing, and are perhaps surprised to see that God answered it. But, you know, there are other times that we have to stick at it and stick at it. In fact, why don't we read a little passage again from Matthew that, that brings that home to us. In Matthew 7, verse 7, Jesus says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. But what I need to say is, in the Greek text, and all the New Testament was written in Greek, which was the international language of the day, that verb there, ask, seek, knock, they're all what, what's called the present continuous. It's ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. That's the sense behind these words. In other words, don't just ask once, don't just knock once and think, oh, I didn't get answered. Go away. Because Jesus says, for everyone who asks, that is, keeps on asking, receives. And he who keeps on seeking finds, and to him who keeps on knocking, the door will be opened. And why can he say that? Because of what he says next. For which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? God is not like some you know, wicked father in the sky or, or some malevolent deity in the heaven waiting for David Tavener to ask something and then as you ask for a fish, say, sure, just close your eyes a minute, hold out your hands and then drops into your hands something else nasty instead. He is not like that. Jesus is saying God does not have nasty surprises for his children. If you ask for a fish, he's not going to give you a snake. If you ask for bread, he's not going to give you a stone. Come on, for goodness sake. You know, you, you human mothers and fathers, you know, you wouldn't do that to your kids, would you? Then how much less would God, your heavenly father, do this to you? So keep on asking why. Because you can trust him. And if he's not answered immediately, I can guarantee you, There'll always be some reason that you can't just see yet, but you will later. So ask, keep on asking, not keep on knocking, seek, keep on seeking. And remember, as you do, your father is a good father and he's eager to give you good things. You said at the beginning that for Jesus, prayer was a priority. If it's our priority, will it change us? Yeah, I'm sure it will. I mean, it's probably going to change the pattern of our life, first of all. Uh, it means that we're going to do some things differently, not that we're going to become a hermit and go up to our bedroom and spend 24-7 praying, but it will change how we approach life in terms of the time we give to prayer, but it also will change how we approach life in the, in the sense of the confidence with which we can approach life. Why? Because we've handed it over to God. God we have got this enormous blow up at work at the moment. I don't know what is going to happen. But this I know, Lord, I've given it to you today. And whatever happens, you're with me. You're going to give me wisdom. I've asked for that. I'm believing for that as I go. So I, I don't know what lies ahead, but I've put the day into your hands, Lord. And that is surely going to change not only me. I believe it's going to change it as well. Well, it makes perfect sense to me, surrounded by the Lord's Prayer, to ask you, Mike, if you would pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. Amen. Mike Beaumont and David Taverner in the Holy Land, tracing the life of Jesus then and now. Check out the UCB website for the free episode guide with photos, Bible references and background information. Go to ucb.co.uk forward slash Jesus then and now. And you can hear more 30 minute conversations with Mike and David talking about the Bible on the UCB player app. Under podcasts, just select Bible books, Bible biogs or Bible surprises. Bible surprises.